Assalamualaikum to all the participants. Uh, welcome to this webinar. सबसे पहले इनर्जी गैस का हम लोग इंट्रोडक्शन करवा रहे हैं ठीक है उसके बाद देन जो हमारी आज का टॉपिक है जो वेबिनार है उस पर जो हमारे एक्सपर्ट हैं इंजीनियर मोहसाद वो उसके ऊपर अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन देंगे तो सबसे पहले जो हसीब सरवर साहब हैं यहाँ पे मैनेजर वो आपको इंट्रोडक्शन करवाएंगे इनर्जी डेस्क का सो हसीब साहब ओवर टू यू थैंक यू हरून वेलकम ऑल दार्टिसिपेंट्स this is a brief uh, background of the project under which the energy desk is uh, established in smida head office uh, actually it is a, a jeff funded project a uh, sustainable energy initiative for industries in pakistan uh, having the objective to reduce the green gas uh, emissions and promote the our renewable energy and energy efficiency measures in the uh, uh, industrial sector of pakistan uh as per output of the uh, project there is there is was a uh, uh, deliverable uh, to establish an energy desk uh, to promote uh, uh, renewable energy technologies and energy efficiency technologies in pakistan uh, by promoting uh, 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 experts technology service providers and through the advisory services uh this is the introduction of the energy desk which is established uh, in smida head office uh, it is basically a one stop facility for small and medium businesses uh regarding the energy efficiency and renewable energy and uh, this is not just a, a desk we have well uh, a dedicated uh, web portal uh, where we have placed some uh, knowledge information related to renewable energy and en energy efficiency uh from this online uh, repository of information uh, sme can get uh, the information like uh, best practices manuals guidelines uh, government rules and regulations uh, service providers uh, 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 that is the energy experts and energy companies escos uh, and then the case studies as well uh these are the services which are currently offered by uh, from the platform of energy desk uh, first one is the counseling and information dissemination uh this put uh, this uh, uh, desk is provide the information to smes regarding the government government support incentives and rules and regulations plus it is also provided data uh, contact details of energy experts and technology service providers uh plus uh, from this uh, portal uh, assemblies can can get to information can 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 get the, the documents like case studies and practices practices related to energy efficiency renewable energy in different sectors uh, the second one uh, deliverable of the energy desk is the capacity building uh, we have a dedicated uh, calendar for the training programs uh, related to the energy efficiency and renewable energy and this program is also part of that capacity building component uh we have identified the uh, areas where smes uh, need some uh, training so we then arrange those trainings uh, uh <clears throat> related to the energy efficiency and renewable energy uh and then this then there is a linkage development between the industries and, and experts to organize training programs as well this is one of the thing uh the second one the third one is the technical assistance and uh, those smes which uh, seek some uh technical facility uh, facilitation like uh, to conduct uh, energy audits or uh, to implement energy management system so this desk will connect uh, those smes with the experts uh, who are providing those services uh, plus uh, 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 sometimes smes also need some information regarding the financing so we have also pro provide the smes to uh, about the available financing uh, options that is uh, offered by the commercial banks and or the uh, state bank of pakistan then uh, gender mainstreaming it is to promote the women entrepreneurs in in the field of energy and renewable energy and also uh, promote uh, encourage them to participate in such type of trainings now this is how can you reach energy desk uh, you can visit physically to smida head office this is the fifth floor third building one ikbal lahore or you can send your queries via email and which is energydesk@smida.org.pk or you can visit our uh, dedicated portal which whose address is energydesk.smida.org and submit your query over there or you can or you can also call us uh, on our number 
now uh, this is the uh, can you please open the website you the live uh, live uh, portal uh, and the desk energy desk portal this is the energy desk port portal you can see uh, on the top menu we have trainings downloads energy experts technical suppliers query section now if you open the download section there are sub sections best practices manual self assessment tools training materials includes all the presentations of the uh, of the training program that have been conducted through this uh, platform financing guidelines uh, provides the information related to the uh, financing requirements offered by different banks technical guidebooks having different topics then covid sops these are the uh, download section then we have energy experts section please click it drop down please now you can see this is the energy experts details we have enlisted uh, more than 50 energy experts related to the uh, uh, in the field of energy efficiency you can uh, select uh, you can uh, filter out from uh, from the top menu uh, with respect to the field and uh, city wise next next up this plan please this this, uh, this section is related to the uh, those uh, technology supplies details related to, to the renewable energy and energy efficiency as you can see there are more than 150 uh, service providers technology service providers who are offering some like solar panels or, or batteries or inverters like that you can contact them and get okay next top menu please q section q section q section. this we have got an online query system uh, any person any sme who have some question related to renewable energy efficiency can fill it this form and send to us our in house experts will reply your queries within two working days and uh, contact us please and you can reach us from this uh, um, uh, detail uh, we are available our experts are available there is there is a phone number as well you can call and get uh, advice from our very knowledgeable experts and this is the actually a very short uh, uh, brief description about what is in the desk and what we are offering right now uh, thank you very much over to harun uh actually we have some request from some participant that to, to conduct the in the, uh, this program in urdu actually we have some uh, international participants as well so just to cater them uh, the train, uh, the presentation will be in english so if you have any problem or any question you can ask at the end of the presentation we our resource person will explain those points those ideas those concepts in urdu as well uh thank you for your cooperation Uh, thank you so much, Sita, for uh, introducing the uh, energy decks. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite our trainer, 
uh, engineer Moaz uh, to kindly start the presentation uh, for the today's webinar, use of AI and IoT in energy sector and manufacturing industry. So over to you, engineer Moazita. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Haseeb and Mr. Haroon. So the topic on the anvil today is the use of artificial intelligence and IoT, Internet of Things, in energy sector and the manufacturing industry. My name is Moazal Taf, and here is my brief profile. Uh, I'm in an energy auditor in Thailand, as well as I'm a PhD scholar at King Mongkut University in the field of energy technology. Prior to that, I have done my master's degree uh, from the Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, in the field of energy engineering, and I also hold MBA from Camilo Jose University, Spain. Uh, prior to that, my bachelor degree was done in Sweden. Overall, I have uh, seven years of work experience, including three years of experience in the energy sector. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to uh, walk you through the different, from the very uh, basis of the things to their applications. There will be three parts of the presentation. Part one includes the introduction of the things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, supervised learning, knowledge, unsupervised learning, artificial neural network, ANN, deep learning, hierarchical feature learning, deep enforcement learning, and how IoT works and its structure. Second part will be based on the applications for business for AI and IoT. So that will include AI for business, AI and IoT in the field of automotive manufacturing, AI IoT for driver's experience, AI enabled driver's assistance, and then AI's application in the field of energy for low carbon development for smart grids, renewable energy project production forecasting, and that's something I'm doing uh, that is somehow related to my PhD thesis also. Then AI and IoT for the waste management in smart cities. AI and IoT for cattle farming. Then those of you who are related to the field of uh, energy, this is something very important, peer-to-peer -peer electricity trading. And that will be done through the blockchain. So uh, that will be discussed in this today's presentation along with some of the case studies. So third part will be industry 4.0 and industrial internet of things before we will go to the conclusion and uh, conclude the things. So what is AI? Uh, by definition, it means the theory and development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normal, normally require human intelligence. Now, when we say human intelligence, what does it mean? Like, so systems that think like humans, that include machine learning, automated reasoning, artificial consciousness, and knowledge representation, cognitive analytics. Systems that listen like humans, like speech recognition, systems that read like humans, visual recognition, and systems that act like humans, autonomous systems, cyber metrics. And the examples in our everyday life include self-driving cars, chatbot, AlphaGo, navigation systems, surveillance camera, and so on. So how to achieve um, AI? There are many branches of AI technologies including fuzzy logic, machine learning, planning and scheduling, robotics and perception, expert system, multi-agent system, evolutionary computation. And what is machine learning? Well, machine learning is a subset of AI. And that is, that is the, the difference that we need to consider. It is a subset of AI. And it's the study of algorithms and the statistical models that computer system use to progressively, progressively improve their performance on a certain task. So these mathematical models are based on the sample data known as training data in order to make predictions or decision without being ex explicitly programmed to perform any task. So we have two types of machine learning. One is the supervised learning or semi-supervised learning. The other one is unsupervised learning. I'm going to talk uh, in detail about the, the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we have two more branches, classification and regression. The models are neural network, linear regression, 
SVM, which is support vector machine decision tree. And for unsupervised learning, we have clustering, feature learning, and outlier detection. And in these, we have models like Bayesian models, Markov model, ensemble method, nearest neighbor, Gaussian mixture, et cetera. And then what is the knowledge? So we have talked about like classification and regression, which is the part of supervised learning. While other three, clustering, feature learning, and outlier detection, they are part of unsupervised learning. So the purpose of the machine learning is to automatically or semi-automatically acquire knowledge by analyzing large amount of data. So things produce data, but then we have to organize it in a certain way to get information that makes sense. And that is called knowledge. And knowledge is generally defined as a quantitative description of the relationship within data. Now coming to the classification and regression association, which is part of supervised learning. This knowledge is obtained, is, it is a quantitative description of the functional relationship between multiple variables. Clustering, it's a knowledge that is obtained in a quantitative description of similarity between multiple data sets. Feature learning, it's a mathematical transformation from the initial feature space to new feature space with better mathematical properties. We are going to see some examples also. And then outlier detection. It's a knowledge that is obtained in a quantitative description of anomaly or abnormal data samples. Here we have the example from the supervised learning. So what is, what is basically how it works? We actually have a sample data and then the label data. And we have to uh, train something in between to get the acquired result. So we know the output beforehand and we have to change the parameters. We have to keep training the data, data set until we get the required result. So for example, in this one, we have the car and function with adjustable parameters and we have to determine the error function. So we design, we keep adjusting these parameters until we actually get the error function. In unsupervised learning, however, we let the model work by itself. So it trains and evolves by itself and get, give the results naturally. We don't have the output before. Like I mentioned, it has a clustering, outlier, anomaly detection, feature learning, density estimation, and latent variable model. For clustering, we group the data that is based on some similarity. So whatever is uh, similar in the data, for example, age-wise, a group of persons uh, having the same age or same gender, they will be grouped and that's called clustering. Anomaly detection is the detect uh, data that is detected through abnormal data samples. So, and then feature learning, I'm going to show you an example of that in a while. It's a mathematical transformation from the initial feature space to new feature space with some properties, mathematical properties. Density estimation. Here we have to find the probability of the distribution model of the data that we are studying. Then we have the latent variable model. Here we find the functional relationship between a characteristic variable and a set of latent variable from the data. So what have we achieved? We have the here we have the historical milestone of the artificial neural network. I'm going to tell you about this one. In 1940s, they had the electronic brain which took into consideration the adjustable weights and weights which were not learned. Then we had perceptron in 1950, followed by Adeline in 1960, and all the way to SVM, the support vector machine that I had just told you about, that's part of uh, unsupervised learning, in 1995. And Wapning and Cortes were the scientists that helped in making this. But now we have, right now, in 2006, and since that time, we have been using deep neural network and hierarchical feature learning. And what is the artificial neural network? It's an information processing paradigm that is inspired by the way our biological nervous system works. So if you see this biological nervous systems, we, we have something like this. So we get uh, the data from different same like our senses, the sense to touch, the, the sense to smell, 
the sense to taste, the sense to see, and they are all accumulated and summed up in our brain somewhere. And then some function, activation function is performed and then to reach the output. So a simulated neural network with adjustable weight has been shown here. And we determine the output based on the sign of the result, whatever we want to achieve. It's a large number of processing elements, which are called neurons, and they are connected to work in, a, in unison together to solve a specific problem. Why do we need that? For, we, we need it for adaptive learning, self-organization, real-time operations, and fault tolerance via redundancy, for example, in a hard disk, for example. And now we are in a big time. This is the era of artificial neural network. We have many popular algorithms like feed-forward neural network, uh, the MLP, uh, recurrent neural network, extreme learning machine, and, and so on. So this is the example of uh, the, the deep learning that I talked to you about. So for example, we have a picture of a car and we have, the, uh, we have to separate or identify it using machine learning, deep learning. Conventionally, we have just have the feature extractor and then the trainable classifier. But now in unsupervised shallow feature extreme, we have added layers. I'm going to show you the example again, how it works because uh, to get the distinct result, to get a good result, we need to add more layers so we can identify things. And that is done through the deep learning. Here you have the example. So if you see the first picture, things are not, uh, this is a picture of something, but it's not uh, recognizable. It's low level feature. Then we added some layers, mid-level feature, high level feature until we had the trainable classifier. And you see the final results, we can uh, identify some objects, which is much better compared to the first one. In hierarchical uh, features, we have deep learning extract multiple level feature through the mapping of multiple hidden layers. And the feature at uh, later level are usually more abstract. And each level in deep learning network is a feature transformation. And how it works from image recognition or processing from pixel to edge to, to image material to part to the entire object. And that's where we uh, reach our desired result. Same things happen in test pro text processing. So uh, like I talked to you about, told you about the, the, the text uh, recognition. So it starts with letter to word, to phrase, to clause, to sentence until we have the whole plot. And then speech processing. It starts with the sample, spectrum band, sound, syllable, until we have the whole word. So how that's how things evolve. And that's what we need. We, that's why we need deep learning to achieve our results in a better way. And what is deep enforcement learning? It's different from other uh, machine learning methods. But the result is to achieve the agent's optimal decision making in complex systems. We have examples like... Um, in the field of like taxes, hold them, finance, poker, financial investment, energy efficiency management. Here, the software takes the decision by itself. And it's, the, uh, it's a model-free decision-making control method. The combination of both DL and RL can have powerful modeling and perception cap capabilities for complex systems. So when to use deep learning? When we have a large amount of data generated by, for example, uh, data coming from, from NASA. NASA, they have a lot of data and we have to uh, work with a small data size. Then we, uh, then we take out the data which is uh, needed by us. And then traditional machine learning algorithms are preferable. We use the deep learning techniques to have high end infrastructure to train in reasonable time. So only that, that data is kept, which is, uh, which is needed by us. When there is a lack of domain understanding for feature introspection, deep learning techniques outshine others, as you have to worry less about feature engineering. Like I, the example I showed you earlier, that uh, it, it can extract the image of a car and can tell you accurately. 
It shines when it comes to complex problems such as image classification, as we discussed earlier, natural language processing, I discussed about it also, and speech recognition. And now the big thing, what is Internet of Things? Well, we talk a lot about this, but what is it actually? It's about connecting devices in a smart home scenario or a smart city, we make things talk. And what is meant by make things talking? It is meant that you will be able to extract data out of it. The usage, the, the, and any kind of data that you can extract can be done. It's, it's, a, it's an extensive network of devices with embedded sensors, RFID, that collect and transfer data. For example, you have the Bluetooth enabled wearable devices that measures a heart rate and send it to the smartphone or a server over the internet, maybe your smartwatch. In this way, billions of devices are connected and they generate vast amount of data within a single second. This amount of data is unstructured data and it's called big data. And this data is valuable when one can extract process behavior and patterns. And that is important because now we have some health applications that tell you about your uh, health and exercise based on these patterns. Then based on this, you are able to make right decision in proper time and create an action. Otherwise it's a waste of resources and time. The traditional methods of processing structured data are not designed expertly for IoT generated unstructured real time big data. So why we, what is the link between AI and IoT? Um, well, Internet of Things, IoT, is facilitates this device connection and produce a large amount of data about the desired process. Now you are getting data from multiple things, even from your washing machine, let's say, from your electric meter or wherever your devices are, or your smartwatch. But then what to do with that data? That's when, that's where AI comes into action. And artificial intelligence analyzes these data collected by IoT enabled devices and extracts patterns and process behavior to help you make a decision based on these patterns. For example, if your smartwatch notices that you have not been exercising enough, then the AI will come into action. It will see the pattern and give a warning that you have not been exercising enough and just to keep you healthy, you need to move yourself at least this much amount of walking you need to do every day. So these technologies together can solve real world problems and create new products. For example, if you only have the IoT, we just have the cars connected to each other. But if you put AI along with this, we have self-driving cars. And what is the purpose of the relationship between AI and IoT. Like without AI, we just have some big data. And if this data is not processed, it's useless. This, that's why without AI, AI, IoT is just a static technology that facilitates, devi facilitates device connections and automates data collection. But again, I, uh, I'm telling you that if you are not performing any task on this data, it's useless. But if you want to create real smart devices with the ability of learning, self-improvement and decision-making, you have to integrate AI with IoT. And if you do so, combining AI technology with IoT enabled devices, you can improve preview solutions and create fantastic products. For example, you have voice enabled Google Home that combines Google AI with IoT enabled smart home devices. And people can control home appliances with their voices. And that's, a, that's the technology we are in this era already. But how IoT works? Well, we have different technologies. We have the radio frequency, radio frequency identity, RFID, to identify and track the data of things. It, it generates tags. Then we have sensors. It collects and processes the data to detect the changes in the physical status of the things. Then we have smart tech. It enhances the power of the network by devolving processing capabilities to different parts of the network. And then nanotechnology, which is very smaller and smaller things, and it, but they, they are on the embedded 
uh, circuits and have the ability to connect and interact. Let's talk you, uh, walk you through more into the structure of IoT. As IoT is a gigantic network consisting of network of devices and computers connected through a series of intermediate technologies, where we have technologies like RFIDs, wireless connections, sensors, and they may act as enablers of the connectivity. So we have RFIDs to tag things in real time for traceability and addressability. And then we have sensors to feel things which act as a primary devices to collect data from the environment. Then we have nanotechnology, which is like miniaturization, small things, shrinking things. Now your, uh, the size of your uh, smartwatches, laptops, smartphones, it's reducing as the technology is evolving. Because of this, thanks to this nanotechnology that has provoked the ability of smaller things to interact and connect with the things or smart devices. Embedded intelligence in the embedded systems, they, are, they have the ability to think things through sensors and they have performed network connection to the uh, internet. It can make things realizing the intelligent control. This is the status of uh, connectivity in, the, in today's world. Back in 2003, we have, we, our world population was 6.3 billion, while our number of connected devices was just 500 million. So the ratio of each person to number of connected devices, that was just 0 0.08. And that kept on increasing uh, in 2010. And in 2015, we have 25 billion connected devices for a population of 7.2 billion. So the ratio was 3.47. And in, back in 2020, we have 50 billion connected devices for the population of 7.6 billion. So what is permanent? Change is the only permanent thing in this world. So this is IoT's network of networks. You see that they're, all of these things are connected. All of these fields are connected. Energy, transport, education, business, so you, there are some individual networks then connected to the bigger hubs, to the government. I'm going to uh, show you some examples uh, in this slide. Uh, these networks are connected with added security, analytics, and management cap capabilities. And this will allow IoT to become even more powerful in what it can help people to achieve their desired results. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about data and IoT, so we have some knowledge management also. So you see the hierarchy, we start with the data, but data alone is meaningless. We organize this data into information to answer who, what, when, where questions. Then this information is transformed into knowledge to answer questions like how, and then this knowledge is transformed, transformed further into the understanding to appreciation why? Until we have the wisdom, evaluated understanding, we have the desired result, the big, the, the information that we want to extract, one line information from the big data, it's called wisdom. And based on that, we can take smarter decisions. So the more data that is created, the better results you have, the better understanding and wisdom you can achieve. And today I'm uh, talking to the value of this wisdom. Through this, industries have been uh, getting a lot of profit. So uh, GE estimates on potential of just 1% of saving applied using IoT across global industries. So this is the result of just 1% of saving that was achieved due to this wisdom and due to this data that we collected. We have connected machine and data that can eliminate up to 150 billion US dollar or in waste across different industries. So you have aviation where you can just by 1% of fuel saving, you can save around 30 billion US dollar within 15 years of time by just saving 1% of fuel saving. Same goes for the power uh, industry. If you have the gas fired generation and by just 
doing the one percent of fuel saving, you can uh, save sixty six billion of the U.S. dollars within fifteen years. Same goes for healthcare, where you can save sixty three billion. Uh, rail industries twenty seven billion, and oil and gas. Just look at it. One percent on reduction in capital expenditures, and you will be able to save ninety billion U.S. dollar in over fifteen years of time. So that's how important this is. Now coming to the application, the second part of this presentation, we have AI and IoT applications for business. So what kind of things we have? There are the applications. Prediction for future outcomes and trends, for efficient decision making, we need this. For classifying and monitoring data, for we need this for managing employee and client costs, for smart CRMs, for enhanced customer experience, for robotic automation of processes, for intelligent time tracking software, and building and home automation, and most importantly for energy management. We are the energy guys, so we 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 take into consideration this thing very seriously. Now again, AI for business. So let's uh, take an example of the automotive value chain. So if you are talking about the manufacturing, artificial intelligence helps you in uh, doing the better design, in improving the supply chain, the production, the post-production. And after manufacturing, it goes to the transfer transportation. Here, AI helps you again with driver assistance, with autonomous driving, with cloud computing, with driver risk assessment, and driver monitoring. And, and then again, it helps you in the service of the car, of your vehicle by doing predictive maintenance and insurance. And it can help you improve the user experience, enable faster innovation cycle, and enhance the entire workflow in manufacturing and maintenance, like I talked to you about. So it, it's helping you throughout, right from manufacturing to the service of the vehicle. Here we again, we have the different industries, how AI and IoT or machine learning is helping us. So we have different uh, uh, industries like retail, electric utilities, manufacturing, healthcare, and education. So again, from start of the project until the whole life cycle project, it is going to help you. By, uh, in retail, it helps by anticipating demand trends while optimize, optimizing and automating supplier negotiation and contracting. In production, it's going to help you in automating warehouse and store operation, optimize merchandising, product assortment, and microspace. It helps in promoting up op by optimizing the pricing, personalized promotion, and tailored websites. And in uh, by personalizing tips and suggestion, offer intermediate assistance with virtual agents. So you see, uh, right until the the the, the the end of that is going to the client. It's going to help you right from the manufacturing to the taking care of the thing to client management. It's helping you throughout. In increased market competition in the automotive industry, you have to in, invest in better equipment and adopt intelligent AI solutions to enhance the efficiency and quality of the product life cycle. So if your automotive, uh, automotive um, vehicles, they are equipped with the intelligent systems that allow streamlining working flows, workflows, identifying defects in car components and improving quality controls, that's going to help the original equipment manufacturer. And then again, uh, it helps you by doing the cost and prediction, predicting the car malfunctioning while producing safer and more innovative products. For example, we have Audi, which is testing AI to identify tiny cracks in the metal sheet with the help of computer vision. It is all done automatically. It is very reliable and it is done very fast. So we have some cases in AI automotive that are commonly used. For example, computer vision for malfunction detection as we talked about the case of Audi, enhanced quality control and decreased waste management processes. Predictive maintenance to improve the efficiency of production equipment and assistance with the creation of the products at the design stage and discovering algorithms 
to optimize the use of power units and build more efficient tools. So in these days, we have AI in cars that cover the entire driving experience. It's not just for the uh, predictive maintenance of the cars, but also the driving experience. It helps in providing uh, uh, more efficient cars. In automotive manufacturing, we are going, they are eager to create AI powered systems to facilitate self-driving cars and stay on the competitive edge. So we now we are in this era already, and there are some cars uh, which are self-driving. They have the ability, uh, they are self-driven and they don't need a driver. So these systems, when they are combined in a spectrum of AI powered technologies like computer vision, natural language processing, and robotic process automation to develop vehicle that's going to ensure safe driving. There will not be any rash driving, drunk drivers, and they can operate without human, human intervention in the new, near future. Actually, uh, there are some cars available which are self-driven in this era already. And with the evolving trend of car connectivities, vehicles can connect with each other not only with each other, but also the central hub of the original equipment manufacturer, OEMs. And this will help to uh, do the better understanding of the traffic patterns and driver's behaviors and to prevent accidents. Like I mentioned, it helps in the driver assessment also. So uh, if, we, if, we are, if we have a car vehicle driven by a driver, we can do the analysis of the driver's history of driving and based on that, that's again data. And here AI can predict the potential issues following his absent-mindedness and even sense the driver's current mood based on the driving behaviors and can generate flags or warnings also. And uh, this is something we are also, uh, we can also apply on electric vehicles, which is driven by the batteries, operated by the batteries. So you can get the warning in time. And therefore, by utilizing monitoring system and intelligent cameras, AI can monitor driver's vitals to warn him and take control of the vehicle in case of emergency. Here we have levels of vehicle automation. If we previously we had no automation, where all the driver performs all driving tasks, then we have driver automation. Here some feature, uh, I mean driver control most of the things, but some feature may be included in the vehicle design that were auto, that were based on the auto mode. Then came the partial automation until uh, we have all the way through to full automation, where we vehicle is capable of performing all driving functions under all conditions. We don't need a driver anymore and we don't need a driver to take control of the vehicle. This is where we are now. So AI enabled driver assistant is helping us uh, to uh, to avoid accidents and and to and for our safety basically and these algorithms use sensors ai based algorithm use sensor to monitor blind spots assist with steering and pedestrian detection alert the driver according to the conditions according to the uh, pedestrian detections and automatically react in case of dangerous situation it can tell the driver if the vehicle, uh, if you need to adjust, if he needs to adjust the seat, mirrors, and even temperature when one of the regular users get into the driver's seat. Again, there are some software for head position and an eye openness to detect drowsiness and wake up the driver, while gesture recognition has become a helpful way to manage infotainment while driving. And these software can analyze the upper body position during an accident and adjust airbags accordingly, according to the position of the driver. As I mentioned earlier, we are in the era of predictive maintenance. From now, it, things have improved from preventive maintenance to predictive maintenance. So rather than we depend on the event or time approaching for the maintenance, we rely on the AI technology that provide actionable insights for car maintenance in real time. If we know the history of the, uh, of the car and driving pattern and all this data, then sensors and AI algorithms can offer a real-time alerting systems that enable condition-based maintenance requirement for the cars. The benefit is that it's the ability to inspect automotive parts and products and get better at identifying deficiencies over time. 
This leads to more increased vehicle availability, less depreciation, and better efficiency. Especially uh, when we talk about the um, uh, electric vehicles, which is operated by batteries, this thing is very much needed because if you get out of the juice, if your battery gets um, uh, batteries discharge while you are on the go. So that's going to create a lot of problems. So AI is going to help you with everything. This system constantly learns to improve the, its analysis based on the feedback. And this is also uh, shared with the original equipment manufacturer. So they can take better decisions uh, for making the new cars. Now coming to the AI applications for the energy industry. We need, we have now, uh, we are now in the era where there are, we have to reduce the emission of CO2. So you can see by, back in 2019, uh, we have most uh, carbon emission, CO2 emission from China, which was 35%. And USA around 4% and Russia 7%, India 10%, and uh, other countries 29%. So we have, we have to reduce this carbon emission, especially when we are talking about the power for power systems, electric systems, and they feature a high carbon and energy intensive structure. So how are going to, how we are going to reach that? Again, AI. To achieve our low carbon goals, we have to rely on AI. But how we have some uh, different techniques to do so, to achieve the low carbon goals, which is reformation of energy structure, mode upgrade of the system, energy efficient efficiency enhancement, enhancement, and CCUS, which is carbon capture utilization and storage. But the one which is really famous and which is mostly adopted is the reformation of energy structure, which has been adopted by 70% and it's comparison of contribution ratio you can see. So reformation of energy structure contribute to 70% of decarbonization and is the key towards low carbon goal. What is it? Reformation of energy structure is in inevitable for to achieve low carbon goals. And it means to promote the application of renewable energy in power systems. And the renewable energy will be transformed from the incremental to the main energy supplement of power consumption. So we, you can see in the picture, we have photovoltaic PV, wind energy, hydroelectric, biomass, many more. They are all renewable energy sources. But there are some hitches that we have. At large scale, we have the problem how to enable our renewable generation dominated power system. Reliability, again, an issue, how to address the volatility, volatility, randomness, flexibility, and other things. And for high renewables, we have to address the grid monitoring and regulation issues brought by high renewables. At marketing level, we have to engage marketing and competing strategies in optimizing renewable resources. How do we deal with that? AI, again, AI is the answer. It's a key technology to achieve renewable energy and sustainable development goals. Again, you have big data, high integration, the problems, these are the problem. Big data, high integration, intermittency, randomness, volatility of renewable energy sources. But then AI is going to transform these problems into big data processing, autonomic learning, fast calculation speed, higher efficiency, model free. How? We are going to see in a while. Now we have uh, to achieve the low carbon power grids. It's helping us with forecasting activities. AI is helping us with the forecasting activities, energy management, planning and scheduling, scheduling of the dispatch of the energy. And that is very much needed in the high peak times. System modeling and control, security assessment of the systems and fault detection. Again, that's predictive. Here, if we talk about the smart grid, it's, it has a lot of uncertainty. You know, electricity load, peak time, renewable energy generation. We have a surging increase in uh, renewable generation worldwide. It's highly variable, intermittent. There is sources, for example, if you are relying on a, on a solar panel, but if you have a cloudy day, 
you you cannot predict but ai is going to help you with that also and undispatch it is undispatchable due to their weather dependent nature like wind solar then you have another hitch which is with the market electricity price here we have problem like deregulation of electricity market that makes the electricity price no longer a constant tariff it keeps fluctuating it's time varying and volatile but then with the help of ai you get secure operation of power systems and economy of energy management where you can actually get some profit out of renewable so if you have the prediction for solar or wind the intermittency is removed uh, the volatility in the market is removed and you can ensure the security and economy of power system if you know in advance its uh, prediction is commonly regarded as an effective tool to cater these uncertainties if you have the accurate prediction that allows the decision maker to take proper actions in advance so we have uh, applications like power smooth real time dispatch storage control unit commitment economic dispatch day ahead trading maintenance maintenance scheduling and wind farm pv plant planning here we have uh, forecasting which is i am also working on we have very short term forecasting available from which is available from few seconds to may minutes then we have short term which is from 24 hours to 74 hours 72 hours ahead 3 days ahead then we have medium term which is up to one week ahead and then we have the long term up to months to years however for medium and long term we there we have some uncertainties there are some uh, when we do the forecasting there may have some errors so so far short term is has been very successful both with the market and with the forecasting there are two approaches to do the forecasting deterministic approach and probabilistic approach in deterministic we have only one possible future state but we do not reflect on the uncertainty information and then if we uh, have poor prediction due to large errors it may lead to incorrect decision that's going to affect the security of power system and economy of the market participants so probability uh, probabilistic interval forecasting that's uh, a better choice in this why because you have the uncertainty information uh, uh you take into account the uncertainty information and it can inform about the potential risk that's helping them uh, helping the decision makers to make more rational decisions now we are coming to for uh, to the examples this is the example of waste management in smart cities supported by the sensing as a service now if we embed sensors or iot devices at for example our garbage cans with active sensors and our garbage truck and all of this data that is generated there it is connected as a cloud platform that supports sensing as a service and then this data is shared with the health and safety authorities manufacturing plants recycling plants and city councils so this way you are able to do efficient waste management if this information is made available to you and this is no joke there are sensors in the cow also these sensors are planted in the ears of the cattle this allows farmers to monitor cow health and track their movements and making sure they are healthy and they will uh, they will supply plentiful milk and meat for the people to consume so on average each cow generate about 200 mb of information per year and not only that we have some health apps and uh, your scheduling personal scheduling apps so they they will help you to know more about yourself where you are going who you have interacted with we have seen in the covid times that uh, some apps help you to help you keep track of those people you have come into an interaction with so this help you to uh, to maintain uh, you safer to keep you safer from those who were affected then we have the thought controlled computing so we have neuroskite smart sensors uh, there is it's a startup that can track your heart rate and other bodily metrics and uh, metrics and can be embedded in the next generation of wearable devices like a headband or smartwatch 
and uh, again a flagship product mindwave it's a headset that can log into your computer using just your thoughts it can move a car there by using just your thoughts and then this is something very very important that that takes into account blockchain also peer to peer electricity trading here we have small businesses and household they are able to purchase 100% of their electricity from a dedicated provider here you can see they are connected peer to peer and not only that they are also connected with the grid and the profit margin of provider is determined by the difference between their price of purchase from each organization and their price of sales to consumers so that is called distributed generation or micro generation what is it micro generation is the production of small volumes of electricity by individual household and small businesses using method such as solar panels you can take into account the uh, the wind farms also however mostly it is done through solar panels and uptake of micro generation has been steadily increasing globally we are going to see uh, very soon an electricity generated by the household or business owner can only be used at the generation side or sold directly to the grid for a normal price so you can earn money out of it so micro generation electricity market it's a concept which is based on peer to peer electricity trading so it, it is based on blockchain peer to peer trading it's a big network connected peer to peer and you can keep track of the uh, of the transactions it helps you it enables the producer and consumers to trade electricity directly without a, without a third party or taking a, a selling or direct that they, you can sell to your neighbor for example or buy from your neighbor for example you don't have to take into account the utility or the grid peer to peer trading is an electricity market that exists directly between micro generators it it is part of the sharing economy and what is sharing economy like uh, the airbnb and uh, share now cars and loans from go from person to person so here there is no third party involved rather you are taking all of your profit for yourself so what is the basics of peer to trading peer peer to peer trading here micro generators for example i have the solar panels installed on my rooftop so i am using it for my own self i am a consumer and i am also the producer that will the combination of this producer and consumer give us a new term which is called prosumers now i have become a prosumer because i am electricity i am generating my own electricity i am using my own electricity not only that i am selling it to i am the producer also i am selling it to other persons also so using p2p i am able to market the unneeded energy if i have the extra energy and that will help me to get extra income from that so consumers using p2p see a far greater choice choice over their energy resource with the ability to pick up the exact source of the supply and here we help supporting locally green energy projects what are the advantages of prosumers and consumers no middleman no third party involved so you keep all your profit the, the transactions are transparent the choice of supply for example trade solar energy to friends and family for free or at a discount you can choose that or you choose to buy solar energy from a neighbor local wind or solar farm choose to source as much energy as possible from a distributed rooftop solar system or home battery banks or even neighbors and what is is it going to help the society for sure since we are the prosumers are producing their own electricity they are selling it they are storing it in their battery technologies this reduces the congestion on distribution lines and help improve the grid stability so it's it's not that just two guys are or, or some local neighborhood is getting benefit it's the benefit for everyone it's a win win situation p2p electricity trading is aided by the innovation in smart grid technology hence p2p trading is promoting efforts and we have the smart grid that use innovative products and services with intelligent monitoring controlling communication and self healing technologies so again ai come into action along with the blockchain 
So what are the advantages of energy networks? We have distributed generation. We are not relying on just power plants or the utilities. We have distributed storage. Distributed generation reduces demand during sunny hours. Distributed storage helps us flattening demand peaks and valleys. We have another benefit called energy efficiency. It reduces the overall demand and uh, allows for reduced energy use while providing the same service. Demand, res re demand response, it, is, uh, it reduces the peak demand. So you see, there are current global status of P2P energy trading. Progress with P2P energy trading is slow across the globe. We have regulated network tariff, which often means there are little benefits to local energy trading in some countries. Regulation entirely prevents P2P energy, unfortunately. Well, globally, there is a still low uptake of installed controllable distributed energy resources, which makes it challenging to reach a critical mass to bring the technology into mainstream, especially in the third world countries, unfortunately. However, in some countries, and especially developed countries, we have the we have these things, we can see these things in action in, uh, in real. For example, in Australia, we have a company called Power Ledger. It's a company based in Perth in Australia. It's, a, it's based on blockchain and it works P2P energy exchange platform. So far, it has raised United States dollar 26.5 million. And they have implemented successful trials of their technology. And they aim to create a power system that is long lasting, low, low cost, zero carbon, and it allow consumers to take more control of their energy purchasing options. So how it works, the Power Ledger platform enables the interoperability, which means it can run on any device between diverse market pricing mechanism and units of electricity, which is in kilowatt hours, by way of pre-purchase tokens. So like in blockchain or cryptocurrency, you exchange tokens. But here in the case of Power Ledger, they have pack the token with the local currency. For example, in the case of Pakistan, we can say one token will cost 1000 rupees. And it can be traded on Power Ledger platform within defined trading groups that interface with the smart meters. These Power Ledger system tracks the generation and consumption of all trading participants and settles energy trades on predetermined terms in the near real time. And again, this transaction can be traced very easily because it's based on blockchain. We have another <clears throat> similar project. It's called Project Community UK. It's called EDF Energy also. Here, the electricity is generated from a rooftop solar installation at a housing state in, uh, in London. So power will be used by the resident within this state only and stored in domestic batteries for trading. Consumer facing apps is to be introduced facilitating trading. In Power Ledger also, you can do the trading with the help of your computer. You same like you have the blockchain application for your cryptocurrency. And transaction in this case also will rely on blockchain technologies to keep track of the trade. The pilot project was launched back in 2019 and it ran in for, for a period of eight month trial. However, the UK regulations only permit customers to purchase electricity from a single party, intrinsically prohibiting peer to peer trading, unlike in Australia. Here, you are not allowed to do the peer to peer trading. However, the energy authority is considering making changes to the regulations. Another, another thing that we have uh, in this regard is, uh, the battery energy storage in Sonen, Germany. It's called uh, the company is called Sonen. They uh, adopted a different approach for for the Germany uh, German battery system maker. They they are using the uh, revolutionizing the electricity delivery model. This program relies on controlling energy from its customers to create a virtual power plant, which is an alternative to the grid. So uh, we have the virtual power plant. So it takes into account energy sources independent from independent electricity producers. And 
they collect all the uh, the energy before dispatching it and they call it the virtual power plant this concept combines all the benefit and opportunities associated with the distributed battery storage for example solar self consumption energy self sufficiency and p2 this project called uh, nemo grid project is exploring the economic and technical impact of electricity trading via blockchain between households within a, a certain region you know that's still in the uh, in the pilot phase and they are experimenting it before implementing it on a larger scale however the project aims to provide insights into how electric how flexible electricity prices and grid stability can best be combined at a local level this this was started in march 2018 and is it's currently ongoing now we are on the third and final part of our <clears throat> presentation it's called the industry 4.0 well what is it it has it has been uh, getting uh, attention of academic researcher and and industrial practitioners it helps to promote self organized machine collaboration with hum without human consciousness and the information flow between material sensor machine product supply chain demand chain would be able to be connected independent independently and autonomously in response to the environmental changes and operational strategies digitization and automation of the manufacturing environment create a value chain to enhance the reliability of the production system and react under uncertainties in manufacturing by the smart and real time analytics hence if we have the degradation of the machining we can know in advance degradation of the machining process and the occurrence of machine failure can be predicted beforehand with sensor based health monitoring in in, in this industrial setup it's not we are not talking about human health or health of animals but rather health of the machine it's called the smart factory and in the context of industry 4 this smart factory is becoming a new manufacturing pattern based on latest technologies so what is digital connected factory it's a machinery embedded with a lot of iot system that can transfer information related to operation between the people such as the original equipment manufacturers and field engineers now it's very important if original equipment manufacturer know the performance of their devices even in the manufacturing plants they can take smarter decisions they will know what to improve and how to improve based on this information and this way process automation and optimization is made advantages by enabling operation managers and factory heads to remotely manage the factory unit so they don't have to be there all the time rather they can just sit back relax even at their home and just monitor this data and, uh, and information through ai and they can take smarter decisions that's where ai is helping you so Uh, if a unit or factory if it is digitally connected helps in establishing a better line of command and also helps to identify areas with key results and areas that might have potential problem for the managers it helps in produ produ production of flow monitoring inventory management quality control and plant safety so we have an example of the industrial iot application in packaging optimization so you can see we, we have different um, technologies embedded here and uh, all of this information go into the iot smart product platform we and once we have all this data we are able to perform the uniform analytics to track and optimize it here manufacturer can gain insights into the usage pattern and handling of product from this different customer with the help of iot sensors embedded in product or packaging the smart tracking mechanism that can trace product deterioration during the product transit so if you are tra transiting or transmitting the product from one place to another you can know which kind of weather or condition of road or other environment um uh, deteriorated your product or packaging so if you know all of this information the next time you can make improvements 
if you have this insight you can re-engineer product and the packaging for delivering better performance in both both cost of packaging and customers experience another example of industrial iot which is called iiot is in the field of uh, logistics and supply chain again you can see that we have uh, all this data uh, going into the uh, cloud and they, there we call it the smart data it provides access to real time supply chain information by tracking material in transit products and equipment as they move through the supply chain and through effective reporting manufacturers they are able to collect and feed the delivery information into systems like um, erp enterprise resource or pln if the plants gets to connect to the suppliers all of the connected parties in the supply chain can trace interdependencies and manufacturing cycle times and material flow. So if you have all the information, you are going to uh, reduce the inventory cost and improve your supply chain. This data is going to help manufacturers to reduce inventory, predict potential issues, and also reduces capital requirements, which is going to save a lot of waste and you will result, it will result into lean production of the things. So the conclusion, Today's presentation covered the different manufacturing applications of AI, IoT, blockchain, IIoT, Industry 4.0, and their applications and how and the technologies that they are using. Today's presentation encompasses the basics of these technologies, the devices involved, and their application in different in different industries and sectors. We also covered the concept of Industry 4.0. This concept will help SMEs to understand the use of technologies and the business advantages these technologies have to offer. However, it will help, uh, it's going to help the SMEs, CEOs, to understand the things. If, if this thing happen, it will help in the wider adoptability of such devices and technologies in various sectors and industries. So that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, if you guys have any question, please let me know. Thank you. Gee, thank you so much, uh, Engineer Moss, for your uh, time, and uh, it was a really good presentation. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Farhan Kazim. Uh, he, ha he has asked, uh, please discuss some case study of AI and IoT in energy efficiency and renewable. So over to you, Engineer Moss. Thank you for your Thank you for your Thank you for your question, Mr. Farhan. It's a good question. However, um, I was aware of that. And uh, if you go, if you uh, look into the slide, we have discussed about uh, the role of AI and IoT uh, for renewable energy uh, in very detail. Not only that, we have also discussed the peer-to-peer -peer trading and the use of blockchain. And uh, when I discussed about the low carbon goals, we discussed everything about um, uh, the role of AI and IoT in electricity trading, in electricity um, um, generation, forecasting of the renewable energy technologies and how to remove volatility, intermittency. So we have discussed all this. So if you have uh, any anything particular to know, you can ask. Thank you so much.
Okay, so we have another question from Jesslyn. Uh, can you elaborate how we can use AI in way segregation such as how it works and where to equip? So over to you, Engineer Moas. And also. So thanks for the question, uh, Jesslyn. Uh, yeah, this is this is very important question. You know, uh, how we are going to use uh, AI and IoT for waste segregation. So uh, if you remember, I showed in the slides that um, we are going to install sensors, IoT devices, uh, in in our waste garbage ban uh, cans, and also the truck for real time tracing. And that information will be uh, connected with the central hub or the authorities that are dealing with it. So that starts with the consumer's behavior. This is very important because uh, I have, uh, when I was living in Sweden, I noticed that uh, there were cameras installed. So if you are not segregating your waste accurately, for example, if you are throwing, um, if you are mixing things together and throwing it, you will be penalized. And how will they find out who is the culprit? Of course, with the help of camera, which is also one of the IoT devices. So starting with that, we have the, the garbage sensors. So, you know, for time tracking, for sensors, for weather, for everything. And also the, the truck that is going to transport all of these um, waste that will be tracked in real time. So you can know what time it came uh, to pick up the stuff and how, how were the things at that time. So with the help of this, you can trace things uh, uh, in in uh, in your real life, and also you can help in um, changing the behavior of the consumer, because they will be more alert and they will be more careful in doing their actions. So starting from consumer behavior all the way to the authorities, when you take uh, this waste to the uh, to the recycling plant, you have you know everything. You have been tracing all the data is coming to your devices. So. Be, so people will be more aware, more careful, and also you can manage things in real time very swiftly, very easily. So yeah, this thing is very important, and especially when it comes to uh, the waste of uh, like uh, the, the, the waste that we produce or electricity waste or any kind of waste, so we start with the consumer behavior all the way up to the uh, recycling plant or the production of electricity or everything. So we, we can keep track of the things and we can create an environment which can help to reduce this waste. Gee, thank you so much, uh, Engineer Moaz, uh, for your answer. Uh, so if anyone have any question, uh, we are more than happy to answer their question. Uh, you can drop your question in QA box. So we are waiting for one to there. If anyone has questions regarding uh, today's presentation, so uh, you can ask. Okay, so thank you so much. I think so. Uh, we don't have any further questions. So let me uh, talk in, in Urdu. Uh, if there is any question in Urdu, we can ask them. Uh, uh, the trainer of the Aaj Ki Njim Awasar, he will give the answer in Urdu. Because we have uh, the international uh, attendees, the uh, uh, medium of uh, presentation is English. So if there is any question, hai, toh, feel free to ask. Uh, उसको हम रिस्पॉन्ड कर देंगे थैंक यू
ji uh, i think so uh, we don't have any further question so uh, thank you so much engineer was for your uh, precious time uh, it was very a uh, wonderful session for all of us and uh, i think so now we are ending the session uh, thank you so much to all all of you uh, for participating in this uh, event uh, thank you so much uh, inshallah see you next time allah hafiz